task this morning is to talk about uh, the intersection of great power interests in Afghanistan and Syria. So let me begin with Afghanistan. In the 19th century, it was a primary playing field for what the British called the great game, to use a reference to what uh, Jim was talking about earlier. And that was meant to be a competition between the great powers of that era in that region. And those great powers primarily were Imperial Russia and the British Empire that was located uh, in India. So when I use the term great game this morning, and I will, it is as a metaphor for the competition and rivalry that occurs between great powers. So um, let me see if I can make the slides work. I was going to spend a little bit of time telling you my observation of what the big rules of great game playing uh, are, but I don't really have time for that, so I'm going to trust your reading abilities instead. There's rule number one with a sort of a corollary to that rule which is, in effect, there are no rules. You do whatever you can do uh, to achieve your interest. Uh, and the real restraint is, is that the other guy might do the same thing to you. If you've played rugby, you sort of understand uh, uh, this uh, concept. Uh, secondly, all players play not to lose. You can read that one. Third. You, you don't really know what's going on, what the other fellow is doing, and rarely can you believe that something that appears to have occurred by chance actually occurred by chance. And finally, to come back to a point that all of my colleagues have already made, you remember Lord Palmerston, the British Foreign Secretary from back in uh, this great game period, or a part of it, nations have no permanent friends or allies, they only have permanent interest. So you pursue your interest and not necessarily uh, 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 your relationship with another actor in the, in the game. Now, for Afghanistan, the United States has never been especially interested in that uh, country or that region. But of course, 9-11 caused us to deploy military forces there, uh, as well as begin a global war on terrorism and eventually uh, lead us into Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Afghanistan war uh, has now become our nation's longest as substantial mission creep took us beyond our initial objectives, uh, however you might think of those, justice, retribution, denial of sanctuary against the Al-Qaeda leadership that were uh, attacking us from there in 9-11. But what about Russia and China? Russia and China have long interest in Afghanistan and its surrounding region interests that have only been sharpened by the long war there. Russia's interests, as I've already said, date back to the days of the original great game. When Russia was still the Soviet Union, as Craig was mentioning, it fought the Afghan war of the 1980s, which among other things led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and its empire in the early 1990s. During that war in Afghanistan, we supported the Afghan Mujahideen, against the Soviet-supported Afghan government. We did this through Pakistan, with whom we have had an on-again, off-again relationship since Pakistan's founding in the partition of India after World War II, which, among other things, set India and Pakistan uh, against each other on a path that has produced several major wars and numerous less, lesser hostilities since then, plus causing both countries to develop and posture their militaries against each other. During the Cold War era, the Soviet Union supported India, signing the Indo-Soviet Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation in 1971. In 2000, and I'm going to just put up a map here to show you this, in 2000, Russia and India revived that relationship, signing a strategic partnership agreement Russia has been the primary supplier of Indian defense hardware, its partner in space exploration, and it signed a North-South Transport Corridor Agreement that includes Iran in 2002. So let me color Iran uh, in yellow as well. Russia's interest in Afghanistan has always been centered on its location as the crossroads 
of inner Asia. There are other interests, drug trafficking, uh, Islamist extremism we could talk about, but I'm going to skip over those. Now, on the other side of the coin, China has a long strategic relationship with Pakistan. So let me color uh, those countries uh, in, in green. Uh, this is known in the region as the all-weather friendship, to sort of uh, uh, put that against the U.S. Uh, fair-weather friendship with Pakistan. China is Pakistan's largest supplier of military hardware with whom it signed a strategic partnership agreement in 2002. China was the main supplier of the nuclear technology that allowed Pakistan to become nuclear power in 1998, and it has built both the Karakoram Highway in 1979 and Gwadar Port on uh, the Arabian Sea in 2006 both of which are part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. China's interests in Afghanistan are also centered on Afghanistan's location, but it also wants to gain natural resources available uh, in Afghanistan. Now let me add another little piece to this puzzle, and then I'll turn to Syria. China also has extensive interest in the maritime areas around uh, uh, Asia, and it has followed a so-called string of pearls strategy, uh, starting out in the South China and East China Sea and coming on around Southeast Asia, and you see those two little stars in uh, Burma and Bangladesh, uh, of building naval facilities in friendly countries, uh, and then uh, uh, connecting those facilities to China by road. The Gwadar port uh, in, in, uh, in western Pakistan um, is uh, 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 the westernmost such facility that it has built in this string of pearls. And you see the Karakoram Highway, which goes over those high mountains into western China. And this caused India to feel surrounded, since its facilities, its naval facilities, were primarily within India which are those purple stars you see. They're not all of them, but those are a few of them. So shortly after the Chinese started work on Gwadar in 2002, the Indians began to refurbish the Iranian port of uh, Chabahar to the west of Gwadar. You military folks will understand this as outflanking. Um, and then built Road 95. If you look at the Road Atlas of Iran, you'll see that that's 95 on into Afghanistan where it becomes Route 66 to connect India to the iron ore mines that it has the concession on uh, in Iran. Now, I could add other things to this map. There are other mines, there are gas fields, there are pipelines, but my main point is to just suggest to you uh, uh, the intersection uh, of divergent interest in a place far from the United States. If I could just finish on this, uh, historically, I'd said the United States never saw any strategic reasons for being in Afghanistan and only supported the Mujahideen in the 1980s because they were making life difficult for the Soviet Union. After the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, we disengaged until 9-11 forced us to return uh, again. Uh, but over time, the, the nature of the situation there has changed. The narrow objectives that drew us back into Afghanistan have all been achieved or achieved as much as we're likely to achieve them. Uh, but the resurgence of Russia's interest there, the ascendance of China's involvement in the country, the re-engagement of Pakistan, the rising role of India, even the involvement of Iran and other neighbors mean that this is a region that the United States can ill afford to leave even if we are bound and determined to do so, uh, and public opinion uh, wants us to do so. So I would leave this subject with this question for you. I've asked some of the students this earlier in the year. If the contours of two alliance structures form in and around Afghanistan, and one group is composed of the countries in yellow, right, Russia, India, Iran, the other is composed of China, Pakistan, and I would add Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf Arab countries to that. Should the United States join one of those groups? And if so, which group should, should we join? So that would be my Afghanistan part. Now, very quickly, what about Syria? 
there's Syria in gold. We'll move just a little bit to the west. The great game of Afghanistan in the 19th century was called the Eastern Question in Syria's region. And it referred then to the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the implications of that decline for European power politics. U.S. interests in Syria have always been somewhat minimal, especially since the rise of Ba'athism there in, in the late 1960s put Syria firmly in the Soviet and then later the Russian camp. So let me go ahead and align Russia with Syria. As the government in Syria is controlled by the Alawites, who are an offshoot of Shia Islam, Syria has also been aligned with Iran, especially since the Islamic Revolution there in 1979 that put a more religiously inspired government in place in Iran. So let me put Iran on the map. Since Operation Iraqi Freedom allowed the Shia to come to power in Iraq, that government is also now aligned with Iran and the, the uh, regime in Damascus. The United States was more aligned with our closest friend in the region, Israel, which was Syria's archenemy during the uh, Arab-Israeli conflicts, and with Turkey, our NATO ally, and with countries that had a lot of oil, such as Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and the other Gulf countries. So let me color some of those in uh, as uh, uh, in green. Now, meanwhile, Russia inherited the relationship with Syria from the Soviet Union, just as uh, happened with Afghanistan, as well as inheriting a very important naval base at Tartus in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, Russia's only such port outside of the former Soviet Union. Russia is Syria's biggest, biggest supplier of military equipment, as well as a major investor in Syria's oil industry, and Syria is the next country from Russia after Turkey, which means that if Russia were applying, this is for the students this year who studied this, applying Kautilya's Mandela theory of strategy, right, then its immediate neighbor, Turkey, would be its enemy, as in fact history has borne out, and the next country after Turkey, Syria, would be Russia's ally, as history is bearing out. China's interest in Syria, even though I have it in yellow there, is much more indirect. It's primarily that China does not wish to see further interventions that threaten a country's sovereignty because it has asserted its own rather dubious claim to sovereignty over the South China Sea, as well as having a history of practices within its borders that may violate international norms regarding human rights. So China does not wish Syria's sovereignty to be violated in the way that Libya's was when Muammar Gaddafi was toppled. Now, just as Afghanistan has neighbors in second-tier states and non-state actors that are key players, so too does Syria. The Sunni opposition to the regime in Damascus is enormously fragmented into literally hundreds of groups, many of which we don't like at all, that are supported by various Sunni Arab states, especially Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other Gulf Arab states that are threatened by Iran, which, as I mentioned, supports the Assad regime in Damascus. Turkey also opposes the Assad regime and favors the Sunni opposition, but Turkey also has a Kurdish problem, which is to say it has a substantial Kurdish minority that has a close connection to the Kurdish minority of northern Syria. Um, and of course, Turkey has to be mindful that on its other side is its historic enemy, Russia, which supports the Assad regime. As with Afghanistan, the possible alliance structures in the case of the Syrian civil war are not optimal for the United States. Russia, Iran, and China all support the Assad government, while Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and other Gulf countries in the United States all support different parts of the opposition. So while it appears we've taken a position in the, this case, the conundrum of Syria is that Americans do not want to continue a deep involvement in the Middle East even as our close relationship with Israel, NATO partnership with Turkey, and strategic importance of the Persian Gulf region means that we cannot afford to turn away from the region completely, even if we do rebalance toward the Pacific region. And in conclusion, 
I got the graphic arts people to do this right. cool quick, Rubik's quick, Cube, quick. which probably all of you in the 1980s struggled to do just as I did, right? In order to kind of tie back in to the cartoon that Jim showed at the beginning, right? Today's great game, if I can use that term again, is a global great game. You can't just, like MacArthur in that uh, cartoon, focus on a regional dimension of it. You see on one side of the Rubik Cube, uh, 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 Russia. You can see China. You can't really see, but that's the Middle East up there on the top. And of course, on the back sides and the bottom are the other parts of the globe or of the world. Um, you've heard about the interests of today's three powers uh, 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 as those interests intersect in these different regions. Um, they intersect in other corners of the globe as well. That means the modern players of the great game have to be enormously skilled as it's possible to gain in one location, but perhaps to lose elsewhere, perhaps to lose overall. And so that's what we've been doing with these students this year, and I hope you new folks have a chance to talk with them a little bit about how they would play the modern great game. Thanks, Jim.